uh, Mr. Scott Cooper, who is the Tea Party Patriots for the state of Virginia, and he is going to be introducing our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, I would like us just to real quick give a round of applause to Joe Dugan, if you would. He did a phenomenal job putting this together. And he mentioned something at the beginning when he introduced Mr. Gaffney. He mentioned political correctness. And I want to ask you all a question. If you've studied your history, do you remember the Battle of, of Troy and the Trojan Horse? The Greeks thought they were defeated, supposedly, and they built this thing called the Trojan Horse, and they left it, and they started to retreat. Do you remember what happened? They rolled it in. I would submit to you that the Muslim Brotherhood that Mr. Gaffney just spoke about is using the Trojan Horse of the 21st century political correctness very, very effectively. And, and what I really like about Joe's convention is it's all about solutions and uh, we're going to have a panel discussion with Mr. Gaffney, Mr. Cooper, Mr. Trento, and uh, another gentleman by the name of Mr. Smith who I'm going to introduce the next three right now and then uh, you will get to hear about the solutions and ask some questions. Um, one other thing, I love the quote from Billy Graham when he says Courage is contagious. When a bold man takes a stand, it strengthens the spines of others. The gentleman we just heard from, the gentleman we're about to hear from, and the other two gentlemen are taking stands that are courageous. And it can strengthen our spines and then put us into action, which is what we need to do. So real quick, it's an honor to introduce my father, Ambassador Henry Cooper, and uh, two things about this panel. The first three speakers, Mr. Gaffney, Mr. Cooper, and Mr. Trento, have a hundred years combined experience on national security issues. There is a discussion among the Tea Party of whether these issues are Tea Party issues. We're primarily fiscal responsible. But I want to ask you a question. How many of you have your constitution with you? If you don't, the Tea Party Patriots table downstairs has them for you for free. But if you open it up and you read the preamble, one of the first things in the preamble, it outlines the responsibility of the federal government to provide for the common defense. And we need to do that. And with that, I'm going to do it in reverse order. Mr. Smith, who will come up at the end, is a decorated SEAL. And uh, he's going to wrap up the lecture series. Tom Trento will come just before him. He is the director of United West. And my father is going to come up now, Ambassador Hank Cooper. And he is the chairman of High Frontier, which is working specifically on missile defense. OK? Thank you so much. Thanks, Scott. This is a privilege to be introduced by your son, um, and I'm proud of him, too. I want to talk to you about a threat that is an existential threat, not that what Frank discussed is not, because it is, but you've got time to act on that threat. And if this one that I want to discuss comes to be, you don't have time to act. So unless you prepare in advance, you lose it all in a nanosecond and maybe less. And the threat I'm talking about is electromagnetic pulse, EMP. Some of you may know about this. Would you raise your hand if you know? Well, you're better informed than I had expected, and that's great. The, uh, the problem links to Frank's problem, uh, Frank's area, I thought he might have mentioned it, is that part of what uh, the Islamic movement is all about is destroying what they refer to as the little Satan, which is Israel, and the great Satan, which is the United States of America. So we're in the crosshairs with respect to the threat that Frank told you about destroying us from within. And the likes of uh, the president of Iran has on numerous occasions said 
that if he could, he would destroy this country. Al-Qaeda has it in its charter to destroy this country. One of the ways that can happen is through the electromagnetic pulse. I have the first chart, please. Now, you may not be able to read this chart, and that's okay. Uh, I'm going to talk, and I'm not going to read it either. I'm going to talk for my allotted time. I put it up, hopefully, to encourage you to go downstairs and pick up the charts from the briefing off of the table down there, and they're reasonably self-explanatory. This refers back uh, to younger days for me which was the Cuban Missile Crisis. I discovered the first line on my chart is wrong. I think it was in October of 1962 that uh, uh, Kennedy went on the tube in black and white and told us about the missiles moving into Cuba. And this was a major problem. It turns out uh, he didn't understand everything that was going on. The, the, the nuclear weapons were already there. They had, we know now, on the order of 100 nuclear weapons. And uh, frankly, Castro didn't want to take them out. Khrushchev pushed to move them out. So we came a lot closer to a disaster in those days of duck and cover and all the rest. And we went through that. My, uh, my wife and I were young folk up in New Jersey at the time. And I'm a South Carolinian, by the way. So, so. Um, so I know what duck and cover was really all about then. And we have a threat now that is every bit as dangerous as then. Uh, and it has to do with a threat from the South again. Uh, I refer to it as another modern day Cuban missile crisis perhaps from the Gulf of Mexico with a missile launched off of a ship perhaps or a vessel of some sort out in the Gulf toward the United States but detonated high altitude, 100 miles up. Um, won't cause any problem immediately, it just turns out your lights and everything else that you depend on. And the estimates of experts, some of my colleagues from 60 years ago who worked on this in the national security field when it was super secret, have said that within 12 months it could be that three quarters, two thirds to 90 percent of all Americans would perish from the lack of sustaining food and from chaos that might erupt in between. So this is an existential threat that I want to bring to your attention. And uh, rather than talk about it here, I've got a video, Tom Trento, just to show you that we work together and his group put together. This is a lead in to it. He's preparing, I think it was an hour and a half webinar that was done and he's preparing it for a video, and we'll have it out on his webpage soon, I, th I hope. Any case, whoops, it's the other, it's coming, okay. It sounds like something out of a science fiction movie, a single doomsday bomb that could wipe out all of our modern infrastructure. The electricity grid would go permanently dark, airplanes would fall from the sky. America is clearly Iran's ultimate target. Clearly, we are the great Satan. And one way to get at America, and an easy way, quite frankly, is through an EMP attack, an electromagnetic pulse attack. Every major city in America, how does it get its water supply? Consider that every major city in America, its average food supply on hand is 21 to 28 days. Consider, where do we get our medication? Consider what happens in nursing homes and hospitals. What happens to our transportation grid? Anything driven that, well, most of them have computers in them, they're all gone. The lights are out in a huge and history-making blackout. Some people are without water and we don't know what's going on. In August 2003, when the power shut off along the east coast of America and Canada, unprecedented chaos broke out. It'll be okay, honey. It'll be all right. Major cities like New York were brought to a standstill. Thousands were trapped in subway tunnels, while road traffic became instantly gridlocked. But things could have been much worse. Vehicles may have been at a standstill, but at least they worked. Mobile phones and police radios weren't affected. Once the power came back on, things quickly returned to normal. An EMP attack would make these events almost seem trivial.
So we've known about the capability of EMP. The first study had the commission headed by Roscoe Bartlett, Republican out of uh, Frederick, Maryland, 2004. Testimony in that study indicated 90%, let me repeat that, 90% of all Americans will die within 12 to 18 months after an EMP event. This study was done in 2008. Has anything been done since? No. However, there was an attempt to protect Americans in early 2010 when House Bill 5026 was introduced. The law would have authorized the federal government to take emergency measures to protect the U.S. power grid from solar flare and EMP weapons. It passed the House of Representatives by a unanimous voice vote in August that year. However, Alaska Senator Lisa Murkowski helped kill the legislation in favor of a clean energy bill backed by Senate Democrats. And we know how much it costs to run a bill through and how many years of work and how many hundreds of experts were involved in that. We had one self-centered senator who killed the bill. If Iran develops nuclear capacity, the United States would certainly become a first strike target. And a plan to execute a coastal launch has been in place and tested for nearly a decade. For years, the Iranians have been taking a container ship out into the middle of the Caspian Sea and firing rockets straight up. And then they detonate the rocket and say, oh, it was a failure, it didn't go into orbit. I mean, that, that is the signature. That's, that is a clear signature of training for an EMP launch. Put the missile straight up. They said that uh, America should not be surprised if their vessels find their ways into, Atlant into the Atlantic Ocean and get close to the Gulf of Mexico and a strike America. Get that container ship 100, 200 miles off the Gulf of Mexico. Doesn't need any sophisticated guidance system, anything like that for precision impact. And these missiles in a container, ballistic missiles, can be launched in less than 60 seconds with a nuclear warhead and, and blast in the sky and create an electromagnetic pulse attack where it would destabilize the infrastructure of America uh, within hours, and we will be sent back to uh, the 18th century. 18th century. This is a serious matter. I mentioned earlier that Trent, um, where are you, Trent? Uh, Tom Trento, somewhere here. Anyway, back here. Anyway, he is uh, he's going to produce the video that was made from a webinar that involved four or five of us. It included Bill Graham, who uh, a colleague of mine. We were lieutenants together years ago and worked on these issues. He has for 50 years done this. He chaired the Congressional Commission that was referred to here, which reported out in 2004 and again in 2008. Nothing was done. This bill that you heard mentioned that Roscoe Bartlett uh, uh, proposed that was blocked in the Senate. That was the two Congresses before ago. Trent Franks, Congressman from Arizona, introduced a very similar bill in the last Congress. Didn't get out of the, the Republican-controlled Energy and Commerce Committee. Never got it to the floor, although the whip count and so on was that it would have passed unanimously or near unanimously if it could have gotten out of committee. This is, and, and Trent plans to reintroduce the bill in the next Congress. Uh, a lesson, word to the wise, is worthwhile. This bill would deal with the issue uh, by helping to protect the electric grid, which is perhaps the critical link. If you lose the electric grid, then it turns out a whole lot of things that depend on electricity go down, and uh, overnight, you're stuck with an agrarian arrangement. I hope you have food stored for that. Uh, you may or may not be a, have uh, transportation, depending on what kind of transportation has been prepared and so on. And it's not only a nuclear weapon that can create this. Could I have the next chart, please? Some of you may be aware of this, but the sun goes through periods in which they, it uh, emanates uh, clouds of uh, uh, electrical charges off into space, and some of them interact with the Earth. Uh, the maxima for those events are something on the order of 11-year cycles. Uh, the period we're in right now is a maximum cycle. 
Uh, it has caused problems in the past. There was something called a Carrington event in 1859, long before we were dependent on electricity, but it burned out the telegraph stations of that era and destroyed the brand new undersea telegraph cable. So this is not an imaginary thing. Uh, we lost power in uh, Quebec, I think it was 1989 or something like that, and uh, six million um, folks were without power there. So uh, um, if you watch uh, television, uh, the cable news, uh, Ge National Geographic, which is pictured here, uh, which ran a special edition last June on this subject of the solar problem. Uh, National Geographic Cable also carried a story, and I believe the Weather Channel did as well. I saw an advertisement for that last night. So this is Mother Nature. There are two sources of the problem I'm talking about. One, by human beings that wish us ill. It could be Iran, could be surrogates, could be terrorists. We know that uh, terrorists can purchase Scud missiles and perhaps even longer range missiles for a few million dollars. Uh, we've, we, that has been uh, countered on occasion in the past 10 or 15 years. And if they get their hands on a nuclear weapon and made it to a missile and move it into the Gulf or off our coast anywhere, they can create this kind of problem. Next chart. I've mentioned that the electric grid is the Achilles heel in working this problem, and the critical element in the grid is the uh, transformers that exist. That we don't build them anymore in this country. You heard earlier about our competitiveness and so on. They're built in Germany and South Korea. Uh, so if you lose your transportation and you aren't prepared to deal with this problem, you're probably not going to get help for matters of months, if not years, if ever in terms of replacing and repair. That's what the congressional actions were really all about, to deal with this problem. The issue of the way the energy couples in is associated with the long lines that connect the power station and your home uh, and interconnect the telephone that you use and whatever else if you're using landlines. That energy couples through the grid, which is the way it's referred to, uh, to the critical elements and can destroy them. It takes like 18 months currently to manufacture one of those transformers, by the way, and get it into place. So this should be the top priority, and hopefully Trent Franks will reintroduce the bill in the next Congress, and somehow or other the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, will, in fact, bring it up in committee, get it out on the floor where it's anticipated it would uh, pass uh, with, a, with a majority vote. At least that's what some of us are going to work to try to make happen. I frankly was not aware of uh, this political stagnation and stay, uh, stalling uh, within Washington until the last few months. What do you do about these problems? So if they were to occur and you haven't hardened and Iran or a terrorist launches the missile, launches the attack. Uh, Scott mentioned High Frontier is the area I work in. I have uh, spent a major portion of my life worrying about missile defense systems. I worried about defending against Russian missiles and, uh, and others in the world today. I, I didn't worry that much about shooting down short-range missiles, not that hard to do. Uh, you just have to be near where the missiles are launched from to do that. It's not a particular technical challenge. But that is the challenge in the case I'm referring to here. A system that I advocated and actually began on my watch when I was running um, the Strategic Defici uh, Defense Initiative uh, 20 years ago now, uh, I'm proud of that and I refuse to call it the Missile Defense Organization because it was Ronald Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative and I worked for him. Um, and, uh, and, and we <laughs> And, and he was the guy with the vision. But one of the things I'm proud of is beginning the Navy's Aegis Missile Defense Program. And we have today some 24 ships deployed at sea out of the almost 80, I think it is, in the fleet uh, with a missile defense capability. If they're operating near our coast, they can shoot down a missile that's launched of the type I'm talking about. In fact, if we allow the sensors 
to give them advanced information on the missiles coming in, they can shoot down long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles from North Korea, Iran, or wherever else as well. But some of us have been fighting for 10 years now to, to give the powers, get the powers that be to simply make sure that our warning systems and other sensors, radar that are forward-based and so on, can provide the information to the ships that might be off our coast so that they can shoot down an incoming missile. Unbelievable, but that's the nature of bureaucracy to stand in the way. Uh, it works nevertheless, though, as you probably know, we have ships on occasion operating up and down our east coast, which is, in my, case, in my view, the most vulnerable of the uh, east and west coast uh, combination uh, to an attack out of Iran. But we don't operate in the Gulf of Mexico. And so that is an area that's of major concern to me. And at High Frontier, I've been engaging with the folks. Last year in Mississippi, I intend to go to Florida this coming year to meet with local people, with uh, authorities at the local community, uh, and with the state authorities to get them aware of this problem and the fact that Washington is not living up to the constitutional requirement that they provide for the common defense in this area. And it's not a big deal. We are today, you taxpayers, are paying to build what is referred to as Aegis Ashore, which amounts to building, taking the interceptors and the launchers and the command and control system off of our Aegis cruisers, putting them on a pad on the ground in Romania and Poland to protect Europe against launches out of Iran. Pray tell if we can do that. And I'm not opposing doing that. Why can't we put them at military bases around the Gulf of Mexico? like Pascagoula is where I want to start since that's where we build the Aegis ships. Uh, in, and that's why I went to Mississippi and I met from everyone, from the local people to the Board of Supervisors to Jackson County uh, to the governor of the state and they're all prepared to move if Washington would move in this area. And I intend, as I said before, to go to Florida. I want to go to the Panama City area out in the Panhandle. There are two bases, Eglin Air Force Base and Tyndall Air Force, which are large areas where we do a lot of testing. Anyway, shouldn't be a lot of environmental impact issues and so on. And I fully anticipate that the good folks down there who are rednecks too <laughs> will be happy to help defend the folks in the United States. I'll need someone. Uh, Some place on the Panhandle. I want to go to Corpus Christi in Texas. I don't know where all you are from, but if you would take this to heart when you go home and help inform the people at home about this issue. Get involved. Inform yourself how to act. Uh, to get more information, I'd refer you to um, our webpage, highfrontier.org, and all of the links to a lot of other organizations, including Frank Gaffney's, who advocate this. And, um, and advocate effective missile defenses. Get involved and help with the fight. I'm convinced that unless we get the people, good people, out in the hinterlands to deal with this issue, Washington will continue to ignore it. It's not a matter of money. It's not a matter of technology. And by the way, on the grid, just to put dollars and cents behind this, the uh, FERC, the Federal Electric Regulatory Commission, says it would cost 20 cents a year for the, each subscriber in order to deal with this, uh, this problem with the power grid. 20 cents a year. Um, I think American people, if they understood that, would just simply be outraged. And Congress has now blocked it for two congressional terms. And we have a brand new one starting, and it's time to act. So downstairs on the table is copy of the slides and some other information to help inform you and go to our webpage and anything I can do to help, let us know. Thank you.